Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with you here on Veteran Voices with my new friend, Rob Tiffany. Rob, how you doing? Good. How's it going? It is so cool to connect with you here um, after um, uh, shadowing you, tracking you down on social and seeing all the cool things you've been up to for a year <laughs> or so. And to, and to now finally kind of do the maybe the 2022 version of in-person interviewing. Uh, yeah. It's so cool to have you here. It's great to be here. I'm excited. We are too. So uh, to our listeners who are tuning in today's conversation, we have a big interview with uh, not only a U.S. Navy veteran, but a U.S. Navy veteran has become one of the most influential business leaders in tech in the world. So stay tuned for a great discussion. Um, And as we always want to point out a quick programming note here, this show is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming. Today's show is conducted with our friends over at Vets2 Industry, which is a nonprofit on the move, powerful nonprofit, serving a lot of folks in the veteran space. You learn more at vets, the numeral two, industry.org. Okay, so Rob, I want to, uh, before we get into uh, our conversation and my, my interview of you, I want to lay out a couple of things because it really, it blew my mind as I learned, learned more about Rob Tiffany. So, um, and, and, and feel free, if I get anything wrong, just let me know. Um, <laughs> my friends and family they do it all the time, so... Um, so Rob Tiffany, executive director currently of the Moab Foundation, and we're going to learn more about that. Uh, and for context, going back uh, previously, get this. So previously, Rob served as head of uh, IoT strategy at Ericsson, a uh, name everyone and their brother knows. At Hitachi, prior to that, you designed, Rob, help me, is it Lumata? Lumata. Lumata. That's right, Lumata. LaMata Industrial IoT Platform, which won a ton of awards, including the Presidential Product of the Year, and as we all know here, Supply Chain Now, uh, Gartner's um, uh, Magic Quadrant uh, leader. Yeah, pretty cool. (laughs) You know what? The cool factor does not stop there. Microsoft, which we were talking about prior to us uh, jumping on uh, online here today, you were co-author of the Azure uh, IoT architecture, and you drove development of the Windows Phone, which we were chatting about a second ago. How cool is that? It's pretty crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> lots it, of changes. <laughs> well, and, and lots of legacy, and, and maybe we'll touch on that as we get to the interview. But but finally, folks, again, uh, Rob appears on all these expert lists of who's who, especially in those topics of IoT, digital twin, industry 4.0, uh, and all the big. Uh, publications from Wired, Forbes, Inc. Magazine, you name it. So folks, today on Veteran Voices, we're going big time. Uh, And Rob, are you ready to dive in? Let's dive in. Dive in. No pun intended, right? No No pun pun intended intended. to your military connection there. (laughs) All right. So before we get to all of the, uh, all that you've been up to professionally, and even before we get to, um, you know, what you did in the military, which which I'm going to find to be really fascinating. uh, Let's talk about where you grew up. Let's get to know you a little better. So where'd you grow up and give us some anecdotes uh, about your upbringing, Rob? Sure, sure. So I'm from Texas originally. Um, I was born out in Abilene in West Texas, uh, but but grew up primarily in Houston. Um, and so a normal childhood, you know, went to college at the University of Texas in okay. Austin. Um, go Longhorns, right? Go hook them horns. Hook exactly. Horns. That's right. Um, But you know what? I didn't graduate from there. I ended up, we'll talk later. I graduated while I was on the submarine, Um, which, you know. Is a story in and of itself. It is. You know, I'm super indebted to the military for all those opportunities. Mm. Uh, Came from a military family. Uh, You know, my dad and uncle were both in the army in Vietnam. Uh, My grandfather in Abilene, he flew B-24 bombers uh, for the Army Air Corps uh, in World War II. Uh, And so you know, in the Pacific, Japan, Philippines, all that kind of stuff. And lots of stories there. Lots of interesting things for sure. Yeah. But uh, 24 liberator, I believe. That's right. That's right. Kind of had the two tails on the back there. Um, Yes. You know, they didn't have pressurization back then on those bombers. And so he would talk about taking off and flying for 17 hours on their mission wearing giant lambskin coats, heavy wow. deals. Cause you know, there's, they didn't have what we have today in modern aircraft of any kind. Right. Greatest uh, generation it, for sure. Well, they were fearless and they just did what they had to do, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, and so you're absolutely right about the greatest generation. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Uh, so yeah, just great stuff there. So all of that undoubtedly 
uh, the stories that you just alluded to with your grandfather, of course, your dad, uh, both of them, uh, Army and Army Air Corps. Um, Which so I the, guess is, we call that the Air Force now, don't that's we? That's the Air Force now, as yes. of uh, the 1947 National Security Act, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, uh, so clearly all of that impacted you. In, any, um, so b- before we get into your, your military, what, what else growing up, I think I heard Abilene, Texas, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, was it football? What did you do as a kid that's inseparable from when you think of your upbringing? What, what were some of your hobbies? Wow. Now, that's a good one. So I was only in Abilene a little bit. We go out there. But you're right. Most people will think of Abilene and Midland and Odessa and they think yep. Friday Night Lights, don't they? Right. <laughs> Clear eyes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but you know what? Everywhere you are in Texas is all about football for mm. sure. Uh, you know, gosh, every Friday night. Um, but yeah, you know, growing up, obviously sports, I didn't play football, I played baseball and soccer, um, golf. Who knew? My dad was a big, my dad was a scratch golfer. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're a little kid, you can imagine going to play with your dad and you're a caddy right and then you you learn to play and right. so so yes I played on the golf team in high school so not quite as cool as being on the varsity <laughs> football team but we've got to take whatever we can get uh, right? I'm with you I'm with you uh it sounds like you're more athletic than I am um one one final question and then we're going to get into uh, what you did in the U.S. Navy so you, you were sharing pre-show about your dad brought home a computer uh, and yeah. you really went to town on this thing. Tell us about that. Yeah. So in the eighties, because I'm really old, um, <laughs> you know, dad brought home a, one of the, it wasn't the original IBM PC, but there were, if anybody heard about PC clones, like right. if you think about companies like Compaq and Houston and Dell and Austin, they were all made possible because the, this whole idea of, it's really geeky folks, but basically they reversed engineered the IBM BIOS really? to allow clone computers, which is why you can buy computers from HP and everybody else and not just IBM. Interesting. Oh, so, I know lots of geeky stuff there, but it actually <laughs> created a, a revolution. Actually, this changed the whole world uh, because of it. And so, yeah, I remember him bringing it. It was an AT&T 6300, but it looked like an IBM PC. And so you're running DOS back then and basic. And so I learned how to program basic. I also had this little tiny computer. It's a, it's called a Timex Sinclair. Yeah. It's this guy Sinclair. Actually, he just died recently. He's like, sir, whatever Sinclair. He created all these computers in, in, in the UK. Really? In Britain. Yeah. I think he was a Cambridge, you know, Oxford guy. Uh, And so it was this little tiny computer. You plugged it into a TV set, you know, and uh, it had little thermal, you know, printer thingy it was it was nerd it sounds city. like so in my mind i'm thinking like early generation commodores yeah um, i want to say i'm not sure if the atari ever released it but they were they, did. they were did they as well they had a computer their atari whatever 800 back then yeah so at what point so how old were you when you when you you figured out how to pro you learned basic first right as a kid yeah yeah okay. it's just i guess early teens okay. and you're right there was kind of flowing back between the early video games. And then there was computers that were doing a hybrid video game and other yep. stuff like that. And so I think that's kind of, and I was really into audio equipment, stereo stuff. And yes. I was a DJ in high school a really? lot, actually. Yeah. And so maybe that weird electronic something kind of got me into that. Um, and so, of course, you know, back then, I can't speak for every school, but it's not like we had some kind of computer education going on in high school i think we had a computer math class that i could take um but you're pretty much on your own back then in in school yep um obviously we were all playing uh, atari video games uh or gosh what was the one in television television remember television yeah i had that that was our first game system at home isn't that awesome yes um but i was really into stereo gear and i was a disc jockey disc jockeying high school dances and stuff like that and wow. that, was a lot of, that was a lot of fun being a DJ. I wish what? I was still a DJ today. That was more fun than all this other stuff. <laughs> well, who knows? Hey, we still have plenty of time. Plenty of time. That's we right. can be a DJ next week. What an eclectic background. And really, yeah. uh, I think about some of the things you've done uh, that I read off and some other things that um, I, I've been watching you do, be a part of out in, uh, in the industry. 
and I can only imagine that that eclectic background that that exposed you to so many different things, especially all things technology, paved that way. But before we get into that, what is interesting? You're, you're the first, I believe, you're the first in I don't know sixty or seventy episodes we've been doing here, Veteran Voices, first submariner that we've oh. had here. So thank you. Um, so let's talk about uh, what made you join the U.S. Yeah. Navy, and then we'll talk about what you did. Yeah, actually, I can tell you the moment. I was literally, so what is this, 91, whatever it is. Okay. I'm, I'm literally at, at a gym working out with headphones on for like a radio thing, probably a Walkman or something. Uh, and I hear the announcement. Uh, what was the, was it Marlon Fitzwater who reported mm. to George Bush and mm. came on the air saying, we have now just started attacking Baghdad mm -hmm. with this advanced new stealth fighter technology and stuff that no one had ever heard of. Yep. Uh, and you're just like, whoa, this is really happening. And so the, the Gulf War started and I was going through college and I was at that time and I was working my way through college and I've just had that feeling like I got to go. Mm. We got to wow. go. You know what I mean? Yep. You know, a lot, of, you know, a lot of people are just called to it right yep and so it's like and so and you know what props to you air force guys mm. i really wanted to fly fighter jets like any young red-blooded boy <laughs> right right? <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> and i actually did talk to the air force guys there was a waiting list wow for, there was for air force it was wow. like, you're going to have to wait like nine or 10 months before the, it was, I was like, really? Who knew? Well, wow. just, just to be a, just a level set. I wish I could claim I did, did a uh, flu jets or something in the air force. I was a lowly data analyst and I wasn't even a great data analyst. So <laughs> it takes, but it takes all types. Um, certain, and, and a lot of maintainers, as we know, uh, to sure. keep things moving and, and project that strength. But it's, it's really, I remember that same moment too. Uh, yeah. that was a Wednesday night because I was at church playing basketball. Yeah. And I remember uh, my parents coming in and sharing that news because we weren't watching the news at the time. And I, I love how you have identified and, and you know that um, epiphany you had and, and then that compulsion that you had to be a part, you had to serve. So yeah. then that so then you um, the Air Force was booked. So the you Air Force was booked, them. walked down the hall and there's the Navy guys. And I was like, well, you know, <laughs> gosh. You know, Tom Cruise was a, a pilot in the Navy. Top Gun. Maybe, that's right. You know, maybe that's for me because, you know, Top Gun's by far the coolest movie ever. <laughs> right. um, and so, and so, yeah, I talked to those guys. I had not finished college yet. Um, I had about 90 hours and I talked to them and they said, well, we have this NAVCAD program where if you already had over 90 hours, you could go in as enlisted, uh, but then you take all these spatial apperception tests, do all this stuff, had to get a, a recommendation from a congressman from your state wow. and okay. a whole package put together. Um, and so I was like, okay, sure. I'll do that. You know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're so good and, at it. They're oh, so they're good. good at it. Oh, they're good. Aren't they? They yeah. are good. At those recruiters, man, they're the best salesmen in the world. Aren't they? <laughs> <That's right>. Yes. <laughs> Hire recruiters for your Salesforce people. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, I go in and go to boot camp in San Diego uh, it, for the Navy. And I just want to tell anybody, it, unfortunately, they don't have the boot camp there anymore. It was right next to the San Diego airport. Really? It was like a, a Navy and Marine boot camp right by each other. Gorgeous place. If you have to be miserable somewhere going through boot camp and being brutalized, <laughs> do it in San Diego right. where it's gorgeous every day, sunny palm trees. Oh, and so man. when you're just having to do push-ups or hold up the wall or the angel thingy, right? It's do it in San Diego. Do it in San Diego, because <laughs> so, there's, as you know, there are a lot worse places you could oh, be going through yes. that. <laughs> so, it, so you know, everyone makes fun of Air Force uh, boot camp. At least I've heard it from all kinds of folks. You know, six weeks. But I'll tell you this: it's in San Antonio, Texas, and you know Texas. Yeah. Full BDUs, man. I bet I lost twenty pounds just sweat through basic oh, yeah. training man it, it, we went let's see my first i turned 18 in basic so i signed uh, i enlisted at yeah. 17 and i started in early august i think so we we were there oh. august and september and it was burning Oof. but anyway enough about me so no, you that's, um, that's good stuff because our family we have a ranch in the hill country of texas okay it's not terribly far from san antonio 
and I used to spend a lot of time out there in the summers and I totally know what you're talking about that part it it's a little little toasty it is a little toasty that yes. is right um, <laughs> you're at line so yeah uh, basic and San Diego so I go, How I go you... basic yeah. and um and so uh and it's the funniest thing you know it's like well what do you want to do and everything and you know you go off to your schools and you there's a submarine coordinator at all these places in the navy so as most people know we have an all volunteer military but also within the navy and there may be equivalents in other service branches they can't make you be on a submarine mm. you have to volunteer yet again to be on a sub cuz it's really not for everybody <laughs> And, um, and so while they can take anybody else in the Navy and put them on carriers or ships or whatever, submarines, it's no bueno for a lot of people. And so you say, yeah, I think I, in my mind, I'm like, I'm just going to be doing this for maybe the next year or two while I'm putting my package together to go be Mr. Top Gun. Right. <laughs> and so, um, and so I thought, well, that's cool. Red October was pretty cool. That's yeah. True. Yeah. You know, moves a little slower than right. a Tomcat, but you know, that's okay. And so uh, I said, yeah, I'll sign up for that. And they, they put you through all these tests, uh, psychological tests. They don't want you people just losing it underwater like that. Cause you mm. know, it's, you're in a tube and um, for it's long just, for, and so let's expound on it a little bit more yeah. because I think yeah. a lot of folks uh, may not be familiar when you're, when you're deploying in a submarine, as you mentioned, a, conf, uh, a tube, a confined <laughs> space, yeah. uh, you're under, you can be underwater for how many months on end? It could be several months. Depends on the kind of submarine you're on. There's fast attacks that you could be deployed for maybe six months. You may not be underwater that whole time. You might be going to different ports. And so I experienced that with my first submarine. But but if you're on a Trident submarine, the ballist, the Ohio class with the mm -hmm. ICBMs, you're basically you're going down for like 70 or 80 days continuously doing your patrol wow. and then come back. And so and so it was important for them to do a lot of these psych exams. And stuff like that, because they you can't have somebody just lose their mind. Uh, and I've seen it happen actually. Really? Uh, oh yeah. You know, you never know how people are going to react in weird situations. Um, so I saw that. I remember having to get all my what wisdom teeth pulled out in right. advance of needing them to. Uh, <laughs> I never noticed. I never had a dentist before where he's like, "I'm going to lean on top of you in the chair," and he puts his knee on my chest oh, to my pull that God. stuff out. Cause he's like, we can't have you have a problem like that while wow. you're underway. It's like, cause there's no coming home. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And so, yeah, that stuck out of my mind. Um, so what, you go up to, you go to submarine school, which is in new London, Connecticut, okay. Rotten, Connecticut. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and they have this really big tower there that's full of water and you have to ascend the equivalent. I don't know if it was like a hundred feet. You have to learn all these crazy situations you may find yourself in, like if your submarine sank yep. to the bottom of the ocean. And well, so stuff. so I got to ask you a couple of quick questions about this. Um, yeah, I saw, and I wish I don't have to Google the movie. I just watched it uh, a few weeks ago, maybe over the holidays. Um, and in one scene, it 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 is um, it's probably set in the in the eighties or nineties. And this these this criminal um, network steals an old Russian sub, and then they do they find treasure or something, and they, and they try to outrun the folks that are after them. And at the end, unfortunately, the crew perishes for a variety of reasons, including some psychological. And one of the last acts that the captain of the vessel takes is he takes there was three three folks left. He takes two the other two and sticks them in a suit and then uh -huh. in the torpedo tubes. And it shoots them up to the surface. Uh, now, it seemed to be the whole movie seemed to be pretty realistic until it got to that point. And then I was like, I've never seen that in <laughs> submarines. So, Rob, tell me, I'm just gullible, right? That, that yeah. does not exist. Oh, no, that's part of our training. Didn't you know we all have to get shot out of <laughs> torpedo tubes? Just to see how it feels, right? I didn't know. If, <laughs> I didn't know if that was part of egress or not. Evidently, yeah, it's not. It's, um, they they have like um, you know where the hatches are on top, but they yes. have this you know deal where you know you've probably seen it. Just like when people, most people see sci-fi movies or space movies where there's an airlock. Right. So imagine it being something like that. There's a lower hatch. You go into this room. You seal that. The top is sealed, and they they bring they slowly bring the pressure up, mm. and then the water fills up in there, and so you do it gradually. And when the pressure in there is equal to the pressure in the outside ocean, the top hatch will open 
and then you've got to hustle and you you do have this thing on your head uh if you, anyone who's a scuba diver knows if you're in a weird situation like that you have to you can't go faster to the surface than your bubbles do and huh. also what the weird thing about pressure is um your lungs are compressed mm. and so you're taking a deep breath and you're basically you have to exhale the entire way all the way to the surface which seems impossible like there's no way i'm going to be able to keep doing this right um Anyway, we train for weird scenarios like that, not 100%, because depending on the depth and how much, there's a good chance that you might survive, but your ears will probably explode or something like that. And so, but at least you're alive, you know, this, just, you know. It's unbelievable. I mean, this is, um, and, and this is, so what is, what vessel? Were you on a couple of different vessels? Or I was, was I was, yeah. So my first submarine was the USS John Marshall. Okay. And what was interesting about this one was originally anyone who is a boomer sailor, boomers being the ballistic missile subs, Okay. you know, the nuclear triad, right? Yep. B-52 bombers, B-1 right. bombers, B-2 submarines, uh, and then ICBMs, right? Yes. The Air Force and, has two of the three. Uh, yes. And we, yes. That's, that's all we got, Rob. That's all we got, man. So I, 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 know, I know you're going to, I know you're feeling... <laughs> pretty awesome powerful about that. you're feeling powerful <laughs> unfortunately those are the least survivable oh, of the no. two legs of the nuclear triad the, the <laughs> most survivable are those dang submarines you can't find in mm. deep ocean so uh but my first sub it, so it was they called it 41 for freedom and so uh, i don't know if it was eisenhower and then kennedy you know once we figured out after we created the nautilus uh figured out you know a lot of great science and actually, we could talk later. I actually go teach elementary schools the science of submarines, and it really? blows their minds, all the stuff we figured out in the 40s. Obviously, we figured out about the atom, didn't we? Yeah, um, for, thanks yeah. Einstein and then Oppenheimer and a whole bunch of other people. Um, and we figured out how to do nuclear fission and have energy that lasts almost indefinitely. Um, so anyway, 41 for freedom. They built 41... Uh, ballistic missile subs uh what is it the polaris uh okay. missiles back there for the in the 60s the cold war the soviets right well they took some of them later on i think in the 70s maybe 80s and they converted a few of them to seal team delivery vehicles gotcha all right so seals became a thing you know, starting in vietnam and then special forces became more and more important and boy we've certainly seen the importance of special forces in the last you know, all the stuff we've been doing in Afghanistan sure. and Iraq. Um, and so what they did is they took out all the ICBM silos, except for a couple at the front, to have extra berthing for SEAL teams in there. Then you have a flat missile deck on top. Well, they put this kind of shelter, they called it a dry deck shelter on top, with two mini subs parked in there. We're talking James Bond. James stuff. Bond, that's exactly oh. what came to my mind. <laughs> yes, it's total James Bond stuff. We had all these cameras. And so we could go do crazy special ops with the SEAL teams, uh, and they're going up and getting into their mini subs and doing their assault. And you know, this is so, the USS John Marshall. This is the yes. And so it was yes. originally SSBN six eleven because it was a ballistic missile sub, but then they changed it to SSN six eleven because became because it changed its mission. Right. So it's more like a fast attack, even though it's huge. Right. Um, and so. I loved working with the SEALs, great guys, great guys. If you're in a bar fight in another country, <laughs> you're set. <laughs> and uh, nicest guys in the world, you're on the mess deck singing songs and just being silly. And then they flip a switch and it's, they're just killing machines Wow. Um, and crazy weapons and stuff like that. And so got to live with those guys, hang with them all the time be on there i wasn't a seal myself but i got to be in their missions mm. and it was pretty remarkable cool. so, so you can imagine just like people in big corporations you know how you have matrix corporations you're solid line to this deal but you might be dotted line to this right right so we're part of the submarine force but we were dotted line to socom which is mcdill air force base in tampa right which is the you know so our special operations command right for um you know and so Pretty cool stuff, yeah. for sure. I bet um, you got some stories you can't share with us. Exactly. <laughs> it's what so um two quick follow-up questions because yeah. I want to get into some of the folks you worked with that are yeah. a specialty. And I know we can never do that justice in a little bit of time, but uh what other vessels 
Did you yeah. serve on if there were any others? And then is Absolutely. there anything else? I love how you're going into schools and talking to kids about about any anything these days, but certainly how cool um, submarine operations are. Anything else would really surprise people about yeah. submarine operations? Yes. And we'll talk about the school stuff when we talk about one of my books I wrote for kids about ah. submarines. Um, so I was on an, uh, after the Gulf War. Remember, it was kind of short. You know, Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf, and right. Colin Powell, they got it done quickly. Mm. Overwhelming force, great doctrine, Powell mm. doctrine. Mm. So very old trained at this point. And they said, it's time to decommission it. So coming from, you know, where over there, and we're going to cruise, but we're on the Atlantic side, got to go through Panama Canal. So okay. I got to experience that. So you're on the surface. We had grills out and we're cooking burgers and barbecue. Oh, that's awesome. Because it takes about a day of transit time to get through the pan. And we had like SEAL teams and their Zodiac boats in front of us and behind us. Uh, that's cool. and, and yes, a black helicopter orbiting <laughs> us the whole time. It was totally just in case, right? Because right. uh, you're kind of a sitting duck, you know? That's true. I had never thought about that. Yeah. And so uh, a cool thing, uh, got around Pacific side. We stopped in San Diego, Point Loma uh, base there. San Diego's giant naval, obviously a great military town. Um, I remember it being the Super Bowl when we were there. We had a little time off. And then we did something that's called a tiger cruise, where you could invite friend or family to come on a short trip with you on the submarine. Wow. And so I invited one of my best friends and my dad. And so for the remaining transit from San Diego up to the Seattle area to Bremerton Shipyard, about five days they got to come on and ride on the submarine. Oh, that's awesome. And so lots of people had friends and family that came on and we would do drills, radiation drills, battle stations, missile, torpedo. Uh, we did emergency blow where we're shooting out of the ocean. Um, so that was cool for them. But yeah, I arrived in the Seattle area at this Bremerton shipyard to decommission the submarine. Great timing to arrive in Seattle because it was grunge. Uh, it was the early 90s. Kurt so Cobain. Get, yes. And so I got to be there. It was the, there was no better time to be in Seattle. It's all been downhill since then, man. <laughs> that first half of the nineties, that whole grunge thing with Nirvana and Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains. Oh yes. Yeah, right. Garden. It was insane. And a lot of these guys were playing at local places, bars and clubs in Seattle. And so I remember man. going, I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> it was cool. It was cool. Rob, yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the experiences and the opportunities uh, that you've been able to be a part of, it is remarkable because to your point, your timing to pull into Seattle around that, that legendary part of, of music history. Yeah. What, so did you, were you, were you able to catch any of the, uh, during yes. that time, who was your most famous person you saw live? Maybe. I did see Kurt. Um, you saw Kurt, really? It, I saw, uh, obviously, Pearl Jam on their first album. You know, they were all having, like, their first albums. Soundgarden had actually been around longer than people realized. They'd actually done some stuff in the late 80s. But, you know, a lot of bands that you think, oh, they're grunge, some of them had been working at it for a while. Right. Uh, I highly recommend watching any kind of documentary that Dave Grohl puts on TV or read his, or his new book. Listen to his audiobook. He'll tell you the whole story of the beginning of nirvana and him sleeping on a couch for months and living <laughs> off of corn dogs from a arco gas station until they made it big in nirvana oh, i love that i love yeah. that I'm check it out dave Grohl, yeah. uh the drummer for nirvana, absolutely the drummer for it and obviously started foo fighters right. so he uh so the timing interesting timing remember i was also thinking i'm still going to be mr top gun right and so one person who meant a lot to me on my first submarine on the John Marshall, the executive officer, the XO. So that's the second in command to the CO, right? And he really helped me a lot in putting my package together. When we were in the shipyard at Bremerton, we were parked next to the USS Carl Vinson, which is one of the giant aircraft carriers. And I remember doing all kinds of tests, did all this stuff, got my recommendation. I think it was a congressman from Abilene, actually, um, and all that stuff. Um, at the same time, I met my wife, or to be, and started dating. She was from Seattle. Okay. And, you know, this brings up big questions here. So I remember when they came back and said, your package got approved. And when we're done decommissioning this sub, you're going to report to Pensacola for flight, flight school, right? Man. And I'm just like, um, 
but then they said, but here's some caveats. A lot of people don't remember this. When the Gulf War was over, George Bush Sr., a lot of people don't remember, there was a drawdown in the military mm -hmm. and we started closing. Remember the base closure commissions yeah. they had yep. in the Congress? The so they were really scaling back because the peace dividend, we won the Cold War, we had just kicked butt in, in, uh, you know, in Iraq. Mm. And so uh, he said, they're making it more painful for you. You're going to have to, I forgot what the extra obligated service was. And he's like, just so you know, he goes, you can't be married or anything like that in oh. the however many years of flight training in Pensacola, because they need you to be super focused. Um, and then he goes, and you're going to be on a carrier for like 10 years, probably in the Indian Ocean, just doing flight ops and stuff like that. So make sure you want it. And wow. I've been dating my wife to be, and I had to make that tough decision mm. and so i ended up going with the girl instead of the fighter jet um <laughs> i know it's tough it's it tough is tough well you know but those um who knows that the your decision how clearly it teed up for you to go and do some big things perhaps using seattle as a base of operations for yeah. it sounds like to me for the rest of a lot of your your technology yeah. journey um so so you mentioned okay so the exo Yes, uh, was one of, what was his super, name? Or her I can't remember his name. I'm okay. a loser. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but my next submarine, though, was I, I transferred. So after I decided not to do that, and we finished decommissioning the sub, got my dolphins finally, which is another thing you have to do get qualified. You have to learn how to operate every system on the submarine. Um, in fact, it was harder than anything I ever did in college. Um, <laughs> you know, you have to, like, you're, you're spending all your time learning about how to the nuclear reactor, how to operate that torpedoes, sonar, whatever your job is, cross-training on a submarine is critical because in battle, things bad things can happen right. and you may need to take over for another person, right? That's right. And do, and do their job. Cross-training. Absolutely. It's critical. And so that was a big deal, getting my dolphins. You know, you're sitting there doing a, it was like a three-hour panel with the CEO and all these officers just grilling you for hours and stuff mm. like that. Uh, but then transferred up the road. So two of America's Trident bases, where we have the Ohio class submarines. One is it's called Banger in Washington. So anyway, it's north of Bremerton. And then there's okay. another one in Kings Bay, Georgia. Yep. And so uh, those are the two places. And so our whole strategic fleets are both there. And so just went up the road, joined the Alaska and, and got onto that submarine and, uh, and completely different vibe completely different everything much larger sub big crew 24 icbms wow the mission's so different the mission is really be a black hole in the ocean and just wait for the <laughs> message from the president to wow. blow up the planet that's um that, that <laughs> is so tough uh, it's tough for me to wrap my head around uh yeah. can imagine folks that may be um new to submarine concepts to begin with what was um how did you so so you mentioned earlier there was a whole battery of, of tests to make sure yeah. psychologically that everybody was good to go but how did you deal with um those longer tenures uh in the submarine where you had maybe they cut off communications for a little while and yeah. you're submerged how did you handle that personally you really have to kind of get in a groove in fact some people will tell you the going into a port call. So like on the Trident submarine, a lot of times we're just gone for 70 or 80 days. Sometimes we pull into Pearl Harbor though, and you're excited to go to Honolulu and that's exciting. But sometimes people are like, you know, it would have been better if we never got to see how great life could be out there in Hawaii. Mm. If we just stay at it, you kind of get in a groove. Um, you know, you're on watch. So a lot of people don't realize uh, submarines, I think they've changed it now, but at least back then you're on an 18 hour day, not 24 hours. Mm. So you, there are three six hour watches that you are doing on a submarine because you have no concept of time or where the sun is underwater right. and who knows where you are. Right. So we're always on Zulu time. And so uh, you would be on watch for six hours doing whatever. So I'm driving the submarine, you know, and, uh, and then you'd have two hours or two, you know, 12 hours off, you know, and where you may be doing your other job uh, and then sleeping, right. Uh, serving meals every six hours, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mid rats, uh, as they called it uh, in the middle of the night. So that everybody can get fed. Uh, but you kind of get in a groove. And when, you know, when you're sitting on watch for hours with people, yep. 
you talk about everything and yes. you learn so much about your fellow shipmates. Um, I will say something. Some people may think it's controversial. I think it's amazing. I noticed a giant transformation happen in young men when mm. I was there. I got to meet guys who may not have lived past age 25 because mm. of the life they had led earlier, got caught up in gangs and mm. drugs and all kinds of, I'd hear all kinds of stories. Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes I'll tell people, I was like, well, I really wish everybody served right. um, because I know it transformed me as a person. It made me a better person. Um, but I watched huge transformations of people who, who their life probably wasn't going anywhere fast. Mm. And I watched them convert to this amazing American citizen who's going to come back and contribute to their country in a, just a great way. And I saw it over and over again. Can you imagine being a drug lookout in Chicago and the projects? And then you're forced in going get, to get your dolphins and right. you're learning all this stuff and it, you and you don't have any choice you don't get to mm. say i quit That's true. and then and then i see these people come out the other side and they're they're awesome people i'm a that, fan i'm i'm so glad you shared that um and you know one of my earlier guests put it and i never, never really thought about it until he he shared in an interview that veterans so many veterans just when they hang up the uniform they keep on serving the community the country the industry, they keep on serving. It's like instilled in them. So yeah. to your point, the transformation that I think most military members go through, um, you know, I know I, you, you said you did, I know I did. Cause I turned 18 in basic. You're, you're transforming whether you like it or not with, with yeah. or without the military at that point. They are transforming you. <laughs> that's right. That's true. <laughs> that is so true. Let, um, so any, but before we move on, cause I want to get yeah. to the books and some of the cool things you're up to now, yeah. who else? And, and, I know, and there's a yeah. long list, but who else comes to mind as special folks you served with? Yeah. So Senior Chief Sexton, Joe Sexton, he was my boss. And so on the Alaska, the second submarine, you know, I did have some time, you know, you weren't, you're doing drills, but you're not always frantically doing stuff like we did with the SEALs. Right. And so I was really interested in computer stuff. And he's like, hey, you know, if you want to bring your computer on board, you're we'll see 386 or whatever <laughs> and put it in this in the shack here and can and do stuff you can and so he gave me the freedom to do that i remember like pulling into pearl harbor and going into what's the what is it mauna loa mall there in honolulu and back then you had you know go to computer stores and i bought all these books i bought but you know i bought books on c plus plus on visual basic on access databases oh man you know all that stuff from back in the day and, and I spent a lot of my free time learning, teaching myself how to program. Uh, also, Pascal was another one yep. back then, uh, teaching myself about databases and why that's important and structures and all that. Nothing hardcore computer science or algorithms, um, but doing that just really, and then we applied it, you know. How, how did we how do we do personnel stuff in the past? You have file cabinets and right. folders, right? right? But and so we we're like, well, let's see if we can write a program that could do that. And so, you know, we're talking Windows 3.1 back then on wow. the, you know, these 386s and 486 PCs, so really old. Um, and uh, but it, it was that was huge for me because it enabled me to transition to a civilian career yes. without the hiccups that some other people have. If, mm. I'd, if I'd been a torpedo man or a sonar man and I'd gotten out and they said, well, what are you good at? And I'm like, finding contacts on, you know, sonar contacts. <laughs> right. Well, I'm not sure if we have a job for you. Right. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, so that, that was, that was critical. His last name was Sexton. What was Sexton. His Joe Sexton. Sexton. Joe, Joe Sexton. Sexton. Yeah. He's senior chief. So yeah, I mean, he's happy, are. obviously. Yeah. yeah, Joe Sexton. Um, one. Uh, so you mentioned three three eighty sixes and four eighty sixes. I think our time and service kind of coincided. I was yeah. at Shaw Air Force Base in the um, mid nineties, and I remember you know, in our data analysis shop, um, we're tracking all these maintenance trends and then briefing the um, the maintenance group leader, a, a full bird colonel. And I remember when we first got we got our first Pentium chip computer. Ooh. Um, and like only one person in the office could have it. And it had to do all the, the, uh, 287 slides, you know, cause that thing would always crash. 
and it changed everything. I was still stuck on those earlier versions you were saying because I was the lowest ranking in the office. <laughs> but it's just it's it's remarkable that time looking back and to see now, which we're going to talk about with you, where yeah. technology has gone, where technology yeah. has gone. So, but before we do, let's talk about these books. So yes. it's fascinating. We're going to have to have you back to dive deeper. Again, no pun intended. The yeah. submarine stuff is just so intriguing because I can't imagine how small the population, the global population, if you expand other militaries, have actually served even for a couple of days on a submarine. Sure. It's just a whole different environment. But let's talk about these books. You, yeah. You've got a variety of books yeah. that I came across, a lot of, lot of stuff for technology. But then I came across Submarine Warriors, The Enemy Beneath, and Walking to uh, uh, Omaha Beach. Yes. Uh, so talk about those two titles. Absolutely. So, you know, like they say, write about things you know. Right. So Submarine Warriors, though, I wanted to write a children's book, not for little kids, kind of middle school age, like the same kids who are reading Harry Potter, right? Okay. So it, that's the age group. And I was thinking, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like Tom Clancy meets Spy Kids. Um, and it's going to have some sci-fi-ish stuff and fantasy stuff as well. Uh, but the gist of it was there's all these kids whose dads were on these submarines where I used to be over on the Olympic Peninsula across from Seattle. And they were going out to sea one day and then they got a special message that they had to break off from their normal operations to go investigate some anomaly on the ocean floor. Mm. And they discover the underworlders and this whole race, advanced race that's been living down there watching us all these years. Very cool. And they get kidnapped by these bad guys. And so the Navy is kind of like, oh, well, it's too bad. But the there's always the, the kids aren't going to give up. And there's always a grandfather, a retired admiral, who says, I know what's really going on. <laughs> and we're all going to risk our lives. But you're, I think your fathers are alive. And let's go get them. And so it's kind of like Iron Eagle applied the submarine. Yeah, kind of what I'm tracking. It is. And so they knew whenever a submarine comes back into port, and there's always all the families hugging, kissing the wives right. and there, and there's hardly anybody on the submarine at that time. Well, these kids are the, now the kids of the fallen fathers who've died. Mm. Oh, of course, we're going to let them go on the submarine. They shut all the hatches and they take control and they steal the submarine and take it out there to go find these underworlders. Love it. It's, which kind of, it reminds you of a, uh, do you remember Star Trek search for Spock? Yes. Spock had died yep. and was on that planet. And remember yes. Kirk and them, like they stole the enterprise. Yes. To go get it. You know, it, 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 only a handful uh, right. of folks right. stole this yes. you know, massive enterprise. Exactly. Um, so the when kids did that stole a sub. <laughs> yeah. They stole a sub. When did, when did that book come out? That came out, I think, what, 2010, 2011, a okay. while ago. Yeah. And who knows? It might be on movie theaters and silver screens. You, know, you never I'm know, almost, man. I'm almost done with the sequel. Really? The working title is Underworlders Strike Back. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be brutal. <laughs> I love it. Man. And, and, and folks, listeners, uh, you heard a nugget that, that Rob shared earlier. Write about what you know. Write about what you know. Whatever it is. Especially, maybe, maybe I'm not an author, but maybe also what you're most passionate about. What you know. Maybe what you're, you love to do. All right. So walking to Omaha Beach. Tell us yes, about that. Great story. So in Microsoft, I found myself spending a lot of time in France. Uh, I knew about, it's, I feel like it's that movie taken. I have a special set of skills. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I was really had a special set of skills around these mobile devices and this database synchronization technology with SQL Server. Mm. And so I kept going to France, helping like the bullet train people there, SNCF and lots of stuff like that. So anyway, I was going to France a lot and that's, that's great. So when you're over there, I highly recommend everyone go to Normandy to visit the American cemetery to, to see where all these young men mm. stormed the beaches, you know, uh, for Project Overlord. And so, of course, I, I had to go. And so I remember getting on the train out of Paris and you get off at a town called Bayou. And uh, I think I spent the night in the hotel. And then the very next morning, it's like, oh, I'm going to rent a car and I'm going to drive from this town out to the ocean to the American cemetery. Well, as luck or no luck would have it, it happened to be May 1st, which is May Day, mm. which probably no one thinks twice about in America, but in Europe and other places, 
it's a big deal. It's like no one's working. It's like a solidarity workers of the world kind gotcha. of thing. Yep. And so everything's closed. <laughs> I go to a place where I was going to rent a car. They're closed. I go talk into you go in the town. There are people milling around just whatever. And I remember talking this, trying to talk, you know, find someone who spoke English. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, my French is horrible even after all my time there. And uh, I remember someone saying, Oh, go to this other side of town. There's a car auto body shop and i think they have cars too you can do that so i remember walking there and they didn't have anything and i'm just like i can't believe i came all this way and i'm not going to be able to go there i walk out of the garage at this auto place and i see a sign you know that's pointing you know towards the ocean you know gosh i don't know 10 miles or whatever to 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 get to where i needed to go right and so i'm like i'm just going to walk it we're just going to pretend that we're just doing a hike today like people do right. going out in the morning. And so I'm set out and I'm walking along the side of the road, uh, you know, kind of walking. I had my little map showing me how to get to where I need to go. Uh, I did step on a broken Coke bottle glass along the way. So that was no fun, <laughs> but you just press on. I do remember getting to a lone restaurant that was open when I'm really close now to the American cemetery. Uh, it was cool. Cause, uh, it was the first time I got to experience what other Americans have experienced. You know, a lot of people talk about being in Paris and they're not friendly or they're snobby, right. but I got to experience the magic of being in the Normandy region and being an American. Mm. And I went there to have lunch and they're, and you know, good luck paying for anything. Mm. Kindest people ever um, had this hot dog. It was in a baguette with two hot dogs on either end pointed at each other with uh brie or whatever melted yep. on there so <laughs> that was pretty cool apparently they had something called the michelle obama burger even there that was really, really funny. yeah who knew but <laughs> but you started to get this different vibe and then i made it and walked to the american cemetery and it's this beautiful place you kind of go in through this giant building you see all these things on the walls even before mm. you got to the cemetery you know you you see stuff like you know uh you know, the, obviously you talk about how tough the enemy is and, you know, right. you can manufacture bullets or whatever, but you can't manufacture valor and, you know, guts and stuff like that. You see all these quotes from Eisenhower, the little note that all those men had in their pockets mm. from Eisenhower, you know, the, the eyes of the world are on you right now. I mean, mm. you get chills and then you go out there and you walk and you just see the gravestones going on forever. Mm and it's moving and i got if you can do it i highly recommend going there because it's a part of america it is actually american Overseas. territory mm. uh there and it's a magical place and back to the, the beginning of our discussion this greatest generation fearless mm. um and did what they had to do and so you walk you spend hours there just walking through grave sites and all the stuff you see the the stones you know who were they what were they doing you know i was a colonel or i was a private or i was you know doing whatever right and then you walk along the beach and everything it, yeah it was magical yeah but i took pictures along the way um on my walk and throughout there and i kind of took notes because it was like i can't believe i'm having to walk you know, 15 miles or whatever to right. do this. Thing. I was lucky at the end to even find, I, I ultimately found a taxi to take me back because all of a sudden it's getting dark and I'm like, oh, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but yeah, I, I kind of wrote notes and then I, and then I, I had, I did a blog post about it originally with all the pictures. And then I made a kind of a coffee table picture book called Walking to Omaha Beach. And it's all the photos and the beautiful countryside as you're walking through the fields and the hedgerows and you're imagining mm -hmm. what it must have been like for those young men back then, they were going the opposite way that I was going, seeing this beautiful countryside, but war torn. Um, you know, if you, well, there's plenty of powerful. movies where you can see that. That's and true. so, yeah, yeah. It, what a it was, powerful it, experience. Oh, absolutely. It was um, very powerful, very moving. It reminds, and I hope I get a chance to, to, to take that same, walk uh it reminds me of arlington though in arlington yeah. i was able to go to a couple of years ago and really have plenty of time to do what you describe you want to go through and reflect and you want to see every inch and mm -hmm. just the um one of the things that still sticks with me is just 
you know, we think about this, all the sacrifice and, and, and not just with World War II, but, but over time, even up until the last 20 years yeah. of conflict. And there in the, the expanse of acres and acres of, um, of a cemetery, the immense scope of that sacrifice and the immense, uh, just how much sacrifice you go to, you think about the families behind every single marker, you know, lost a loved one that they'll never be able to get yeah. back in so that the rest of us can do what we all do. And it really yeah. just uh, um, sounds like you had a very similar experience. I did. Uh, and overseas. I definitely know what you mean going to Arlington. I mm. definitely spent a bunch of time there when I was based in Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah. Um, and yeah, people should go see it. That too. People should realize this life they had didn't just happen by magic. Uh, you know, I couldn't well said, very well said. And and we gotta we gotta live with that mindset day in and day out and 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 protect that legacy. Yeah. It's all in all of us for sure. Um for sure. Okay, man, Rob, I, I tell you, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to have a Rob Tiffany series or so many different things I want to ask you about. But for the sake of time, um, yeah. let's talk about you know we do talk a good bit about transitions from the military to the private sector. Unfortunately, we've made a lot of gains. At least when I, I got out in 02. and uh, we've made I think as a military, as a country, as a private sector, we've made some gains. It seems like since then, and making that transition easier. But I still talk. You may too to lots of of um veterans that you know have separated and they're still struggling with some aspect finding a good job finding a job that um is not under employment you know uh being yeah. able to talk to the hiring managers that um can are brave enough and are willing to lean into trying to decipher what they did in the military you know but anyway let's talk about your transition talk to us about um uh, yeah. when you transition from the u.s navy to the private sector yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to get to learn about all this computer stuff. And get, in fact, I was even, I got to be the computer security officer on my submarine on the Alaska, actually. Nice. Um, that being said, when Windows 3.1 was out, they thought security meant the screensaver. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we won't get too carried away. Wow. But, uh, but um, you know, uh, I'm sure all the branches have this, you know, when you're coming up on the time for you to get out, they had special classes that I went to and they had people kind of these transition people in the military who are there to kind of give you guidance and stuff like that. I remember one of the things the guy said, he goes, you know what most people say they're going to do when they get out of the military, I'm going to go home. <laughs> he said it that way. Right. I'm going home, wherever home was, I'm right. going home. And he said, he goes, are you married by chance? I know a lot of you guys are married. He goes, does your wife have a job in this town where you live now, where the base is? He goes, you might think hard on building on something you already have rather than going home, wherever that is, and starting yep. over. Because it may home may not be the home you remembered it. You never know. Mm, what um, great advice. Yeah, it was. It was. And, you know, sure enough, my wife did have a pretty good job. And maybe that was sage advice. You know, don't just blow up everything because you have some attachment right um and so uh but then i remember i got out in 94 and so i remember i knew visual basic and access and windows and it was going crazy and i was in the seattle area okay <laughs> what was happening in the seattle area in the early 90s microsoft divorced from ibm right IBM started to collapse and Microsoft rose from the ashes and with Windows and Office and all these tools and it was exploding. And they were and so, were they hiring left and right? Oh, they were and everybody was. If you knew Microsoft technologies, everybody was. And so I interviewed with a bunch of different product groups in Microsoft, all kinds of companies around Seattle and in Bellevue, which is a suburb of Seattle on the other side of the Lake Washington. I ended up taking a job with a company called Real Time Data, which is where my IoT journey began and my wireless journey began, because we were monitoring vending machines with primitive wireless networks, okay. where we had to invent everything from scratch, um, which obviously leads to the second story here of you know how I got to where I am now. Oh, I was going to ask you. What was the most popular item in those vending machines if you were tracking movement and uh, demand? Sometimes it was white powdered donuts. 
<laughs> and rightfully so. Those things and are rightfully ridiculous. so. Those are good ones, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know what? There were some ex-military guys there. Uh, and so it was interesting. I, you know, in the moment, you don't necessarily know. I took a job with a startup. I had offers where I could have had different roles at Microsoft in 94. Had I taken those roles in 94, the tens of billion, millions of dollars would be just laying around the house, right? <laughs> like everybody who worked at any, I forgot what the time period was. It, at any time period, if you were there, you know, you're a millionaire. I think Microsoft back then created 10,000 millionaires. Wow, and that, really? But, but even today, it's crazy. But back then, yeah. Um, and so, but I ended up taking this job with this company. I thought it was really interesting. They were doing something I'd never heard of before. They took dumb vending machines. You had guys who are embedded software, firmware guys with black boxes and cabling. Because remember, there was no such thing as smart vending machines or smart anything back then. Right, true. And they were retrofitting dumb things with cables. So a vending machine, the way it works, there's spirals that move, that push like the potato chips and Snickers right. and everything out. Yes. And the cans, Coke machines, Pepsi, whatever. They all have mechanisms. So we figured out how to work and know what those mechanisms were. You would say, well, I know this is what items are in slot one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Right. And how many items I put in. And then we're measuring the spinning of the spirals to know that they're dispensing an item. We also can monitor the quarters going into the change because you couldn't swipe credit cards back then. Right. We had an antenna on vending machines. <laughs> we had radio frequency RF engineers. You know, we didn't have all the stuff you have today. Well, and we're laughing. But at the time, this is like innovative, cutting edge, probably vending machine technology, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it's unheard of. Yeah. And so we we create we had to create our own wireless technologies. We created our own wireless modems to bounce packets off of these public, they're called business radio towers, like okay. 450 megahertz or whatever. Um, and then we had the application itself running on a Windows PC that looked visually, graphically, it was in Visual Basic. I think that's how I got the job. Um, it looked like you're looking at a vending machine. You'd see all the candies and the numbers of how many items and you'd see, see green, yellow, red to show if it, if we're about almost to run out, the whole point of the idea was inventory management. Right. You might know something about that. <laughs> um, and as it turns out, it's kind of a thing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and it's a thing today. And it was a thing back then. You have route drivers who every morning get in their pickup truck and they fill it up with all the stock of candy and chips and drinks. And they drive their route that belongs to them to restock all these vending machines because you don't want stock outs or whatever because right. then you're losing sales. So what we initially were, the goal was to optimize that and make it more efficient and save them money. And when you, you know, we talk about truck rolls or whatever, what if we told you exactly every morning what machines to go to and exactly what to bring and more importantly, where not to go. And so we did that all the way back then with wow. real-time wireless data and reports would be out there and the drivers would go wherever they wanted to go. Um, along the way, because we're just a bunch of Neanderthals <laughs> and you stumble upon things, you go, oh, I noticed. So, you know, a lot of times vending machines, there's like a bank of machines, just like a bunch of them right, together. Right. And we would notice in certain locations, like there's, we would be monitoring vending machines all over a city, for instance. And there's different businesses, like on the second floor of this skyscraper, the people at that company go to these vending machines every day. <laughs> well, we learned their preferences in real time because we were wow. sharing real time data about the, getting telemetry about what, what products were selling and what weren't selling. And so we're like, huh. They sure love those white powdered donuts. <laughs> what if we doubled or tripled up on the white powdered donuts? Let's see what happens. And sure enough, now the machine's making more money than it was making before. We're already saving you money, the, co the vending company, but now we're making you more money. And then flip side, we saw the products that weren't moving and we got them out of there. And so pretty soon you're optimizing, you're doing merchandising and right. optimizing the product mix based on real-time customer preferences. All the way back in the stone age of IoT, when the dinosaurs still were roaming the earth and uh it was early. magical yeah, it, it, well, there early. was no iot back then there was no <laughs> m to m back there we just created the whole thing from scratch big data you big data before data was even a thing and, and clearly <laughs> you were using it which yeah. which um 
I'm no technologist, but but uh, we talk a lot about how big data was a big term. Everybody talked about accumulating all this data, but then what were companies doing with it, right? Y'all, were, I, I love that pr- the practical aspect of what you just yeah. uh, described with a vending machine, which it, it all, probably all of our listeners can relate to. Yeah. So what did, so work with that startup. What, what was the startup's name again? It was called Real Time Data. Real time data. Imagine that. So Imagine that. that was you were poised then with that experience and, and some of the things you were doing before before it's time, really. Yeah. Uh, when did you because, you know, you obviously you worked with a bunch of brand names, big companies. Everyone knows. When did you um, what did you do after real time data? After real time data, I clearly got the that whole wireless industry was growing right. the smartphone. Well, it was just flip phones, obviously, in the 90s. But that cellular, because we, we were we were at the beginning of that, we used a variety of technologies to get connectivity, but that yep. started maturing. And so you kind of feel like, well, I'm kind of part of this. Um, we had the dot-com thing that happened, right, 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 in the late 90s, and it blew up in April yep. or March of 2000, actually. Uh, I was doing startups. So I got conditioned to be not risk-averse, risk-taker. And be a startup guy rather than big company safe guy. Right. Uh, turns out you're not safe at big companies either, as it turns <laughs> out. But a lot of people think that, right? right. Uh, so I, I became, you know, uh, I, I, there's nothing more thrilling than working as a startup. It's much harder. You're wearing a lot of hats. You're doing multiple jobs and you live or die based on what you do. Um, True. At, a, at a startup, there's no looking around and say, well, so-and-so is supposed to handle that. It's like, no, you, it's on you or it doesn't get done. You're right. So did dot-com startups, did the web thing, did e-commerce. Uh, we did a, a deal where we had uh, early days of digital photography on, on baseball fields at games. Really? It would take action photos with these crazy cameras because one of the guys who started the company is like an NFL photographer for the Seahawks. He's got covers of Sports Illustrated, Super Bowl stuff. And so we were like, what if we did action photography on the field at Little League games, soccer, you know, that kind of thing, right? Very cool. And then had printers to sell to them. And then I built the e-commerce website where they could buy that stuff. Um, I did another startup. I built a, a mobile device management company. So anybody who, you know, like if you have a corporate phone that's locked down by yeah. your company, uh, it's using AirWatch or Mobile Iron back then, BlackBerry Enterprise Server. So we had a, a partner and I built a mobile device, probably the first cloud-based mobile device management company called Net Perceptor. Um, and then we sold that to a company in Scottsdale. And then I joined Microsoft with Windows Mobile and Windows so was, Phone. Was Microsoft your first big company uh, after getting out of the Navy? After yeah, all these I guess startups? So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. And, and at Microsoft, if our listeners will remember, uh, if you're uh, old enough, the Windows Phone, um, you, so that, if I'm not, not mistaken, that was you, your baby, your project. You led the development of the Windows Phone. Is that right, Rob? I didn't lead everything, but I was okay. part of that team. It was, part of the was team. a lot of big group of people, uh, development, business, marketing, you know, it's a huge right, deal right, at Microsoft. Right. So we had Windows Mobile in the early days. So if you go to the late nineties, some people might remember the Palm pilot, right? Definitely. Um, people who are even older might remember something called the Newton from Apple, yes. which was even earlier. And right. what they don't know is some of the team that built the Newton and after the Newton crashed and burned, it was a lot of those same folks that created Palm. Uh, and then Palm sold to 3Com and some other people and a new company called Handspring came out and those guys created arguably the first smartphone. If anybody remembers a device called the Trio. Oh yeah. But, uh, you remember gosh, a Trio? That is a blast in the past right there. That, yeah. I think that was my first smartphone was a If trio. you think about, you know, cause I feel like being part of that smartphone revolution was just an amazing ride for me. Right. And so you had the smartphone, this Handspring Trio and then Palm bought them back and then they had the Palm Trio. And then Mike, and then you had BlackBerry. In the 90s, BlackBerry was basically a two-way Skytel pager, basically yep. with a keyboard. Then they started making smartphones. And then Microsoft had something called the Pocket PC in the 90s, back when we had PDAs, <laughs> you know, with a little stylus. Personal digital assistance, I That's think right. is what that acronym was for. Yeah. And so 
the evolution of the Pocket PC went to Windows Mobile. And my mobile device management company, we built the technology for, we could manage Windows Mobile devices. We could have an administrator push down software, corporate apps down to the device dynamically, know the health and performance of the devices and do that. And so going into Windows Mobile, it was great to be a part of that, that whole revolution and the, the rise of apps and everything. Wild, and wild west, legendary. It was, it was uh, wild west. Aspect of technology. It was great being there, you know, and, you know, it was all about business phones, I have to say back then, really, mm. the consumer thing hadn't happened yet. And so you were trying to build the best enterprise device. Uh, we had, a, we had exchange server, and we had outlook on our device to get email. And so for business users, business users loved the Blackberry push email was a huge thing. There were lawsuits over push email, believe it or not, back then. And so us having active sync to get email on the phone and then all this other stuff. Um, and so that was an exciting ride, mostly battling it out with BlackBerry. And then the iPhone came along and changed everything. Yes. And the iPhone was a consumer device. Apple didn't care about enterprises. They're like, <laughs> we could care less about you guys. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, uh, and so that was a game changer. Android came a little after that. And I think that's when we realized we had to reboot our phone platform and the way we thought of everything. Because we built our phone with kind of Windows ideas. Right, right. And we had to just break away from that. And so we rebooted the whole platform like in 2010, 2009, 2010 for Windows Phone, where you saw the tile interface yep. and this gorgeous devices, beautiful interface, very differentiated from what you're seeing from the new Android devices. And, you know, they all just had a rows of icons. And, um, and so that was exciting and it was tough. And we got our ass kicked. Um, <laughs> you had to get thick skin. Um, I would only imagine there's this big building at the Microsoft campus called the Executive Briefing Center. I know lots of other companies have something similar. And so you would go do an EBC. So every week, plane loads of executives from every company on the planet fly into Seattle and they come out to Redmond to Microsoft's headquarters for a two day thing where they go. And they get briefings by product managers from all the different product groups at Microsoft telling them roadmap and all that stuff. Yep. I was doing a high percentage of the Windows phone EBCs. And I remember doing those same things for Windows Mobile when it was us and BlackBerry. And I felt pretty good about myself. <laughs> when, when Windows phone with the tiles came out against BlackBerry and Android, it got rough in there. Ooh. These CEOs were like, I don't even know why I'm talking to you. <laughs> but. You know, one of the things you shared with me pre-show, because uh, I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about Windows 10, you know, these things, all the releases come out. And of course, um, you know, here we're, we're in 2022 now, um, the start button. And, and so talk about how that Windows, because I think if I'm not mistaken, there's a connection between a Windows phone and then Windows 10. Is that right, Rob? That's right. That's right. And actually, the connection even started earlier than that. Do you remember Windows 8? Windows where, 8 where the whole thing was tiles. So we had Windows 7, which was a huge hit because Vista was a disaster. Windows 7 was a hit. Yep. And then it was time to do Windows 8. And so Steve Sanofsky, the guy who, who kind of rescued Windows with Windows 7, it's like, it's time to tear off the Band-Aid and go into the future. And let's stop. Because remember, every version of Windows basically yes some variation of Windows 95. Yes. You know, same look and feel, right? The <laughs> right. taskbar and the menus. And so yep. that was like, let's take this revolutionary tile thing that you phone guys came up with and let's make a whole Windows device. Remember also the iPad had come out and so the rise of tablets. And we we're like, wow, we need to make sure Windows could be good for tablets. Um, and so we built Windows 8, which was all tiles, touch screen, pretty cool. And it was a total disaster. Um, it was so different. And I remember us writing these blog posts on the Microsoft site saying, at some point, we need to break away from the past and move to this new future. We just got to pull that Band-Aid off. But it turns out it was a bridge too far. For, mm -hmm. you know, so Because all of the corporate world uses Windows primarily. Right. And I know lots of people love Macs and stuff like that. But rank and file companies are running Windows and they manage Windows. And the training for Windows 8, it was, was so not. bizarre. <laughs> So, and so uh, anyway, it was a race to salvage that. And so um, Terry Meyerson, who was 
the last guy running Windows Phone, um, he came over and became the new head of Windows and brought some of our Windows Phone people there. And the idea was, let's do a blend of the familiar Windows desktop with the start right. menu, but with the innovations that we had created in Windows 8 and with Windows Phone oh. so that everybody can understand it. And so that's what Windows 10 became. And so you still had the start menu, but the icons were alive and they could flip over and tell you kinds of information and stuff like that. And so, but yeah, all that came from the innovations that we created in the, on the smartphone for that, sure. And so one last question about that before we move on, because I want to uh, make sure we better understand what you're up to with the Moab Foundation. How, Windows 10 was, a, a, as I recall, a smashing success, right? Yeah. 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 Actually, Let, we have billions of people are running Windows 10. Yes. yes. Um, well, I love, I love, I really appreciate that history. Uh, you have, you've conjured up some things I completely forgot about, including my first smartphone, that, that trio. And, yeah. um, uh, I loved doing my email on that trio. It was the first time that yeah. I really had that, that Blackberry type, you know, um, having that great keyboard yes. with your thumbs and the stylus type really fast and the yes. stylus and the yeah. stylus came out. Um, so yeah. I, remember, I remember setting all kinds of meetings with that thing and I was like, man, where where have I been? Because I because I, I can't remember the phone I upgraded from, but it didn't have any have any of that stuff. Let's um, so let's talk about the Moab Foundation. And sure. if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, it, a big part of its mission is global sustainability. Is that right? Right. So right. tell us about what you're up to there. Sure, sure. So Moab is something that started a few years ago been something kind of on the side while you do your day job, right? Sure. Yeah. And so um, as I was doing IoT, you know, at Microsoft, I ended up being on the Azure IoT team. And then I did the stuff at Hitachi. And over time, I realized, wow, you know, there's a lot more we could do with Internet of Things and analytics than just commercial business stuff. If you step back and say, well, what is the Internet of Things all about? It's basically just remotely knowing the state or the health or the whatever of something, an object, just like we started in the 90s. We remotely in real time had data telling us the inventory of a vending machine. I was like, I got to believe that there's a lot of problems in the world we could solve if we remotely knew using the power of wireless and all this stuff we have today uh, to, to help out. And I remember being getting asked to be on these sustainability panel discussions and I'm having to study my butt off to figure out a good story around there. And you know what really helped me was the United Nations came out with something called the Sustainable Development Goals, and they named 17 of them. Right. And and for a you know Neanderthal like me, it was like, oh, good categorization. That'll make it easier for me to structure. understand. Structure. Yes. Structure. Yes. Yeah, structure. And so you have, you know, hunger, poverty water issues, climate, you know, you name it, all these categorizations. And so you start thinking through, well, how could IoT help poverty or hunger? Well, it turns out both of those are related to agriculture. It turns out the poorest people in the world all work in agriculture. Mm. It also turns out that being able to eat is kind of a thing. And, <laughs> uh, and agriculture kind of helps you with that too. Right. And so you start studying and going, well, what's going on with agriculture? How, you know, it turns out we got a almost double food production between now and 2050 uh, because we're about to have 10 billion people on the planet. And so you may have heard terms like precision agriculture, but a lot of it is, is I need to produce more crops, but I have fewer inputs. Um, boy, anybody who lives in California right now knows that the water is gone. Yeah, and, it's crazy. And the Western United States has been on fire and there's smoke everywhere. <laughs> It's pretty scary stuff. And so you already got to do this tall order of almost doubling food production while everything's on fire. Right. And so how can I keep growing crops and feeding everybody when I have less water? Well, I need to be more precise about it. And so using IoT technology, measuring those that soil moisture, humidity, transpiration, things like that, to precisely know this is when you need to irrigate, this is when you turn it off. Because people are still, believe it or not, are still just kind of irrigating on a schedule, right? You know, oh, it's right. time to water, just like you might do at your house. Um, and we're wasting water. Uh, 
chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, those are expensive input costs. Anyway, mm. it looked like, a, you know, I'd start writing up use cases on poverty and hunger and things with IoT, water issues, water treatment plants, water, everything, monitoring all this stuff. Um, and then, uh, and then thinking, okay, well, how could I get this technology to people who need it? Mm. It can't be some big for-profit company because it turns out that people who are trying to save the world don't have a lot of cash. Mm. They're usually uh, NGOs, right? Non-government organizations and right. stuff like that and nonprofits who are doing this amazing work. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start off by categorizing. I'm going to come up with recipes where IoT can make a difference and how you as a person who wants to adopt this can do it. Since I know how to, I've invented this technology I myself I multiple Sorry, times. Could you say that again? Don't you love it when Siri <laughs> thinks you're talking to her? All the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, because, uh, you know, I built, I helped design, you know, Azure IoT, and then I totally designed and helped build Lumata. And so it's like, I can do this. And Digital Twins was a big thing I'm yep. into. And so I built something, literally the code name was called Moab, like the place in Utah where they have the arches and everything. Yep. Oh, yeah. And so on a little edge device, low cost, low power device built a whole lot of what you might expect from a high end cloud <laughs> IOT platform and digital twin to give away just to wow. give to people. And so I was like, here's the recipe. Here's the technology. Now, obviously people are the other part of the equation in volunteering. Right. Um, and so I'm not going to say it's a slam dunk. It does take a lot of effort. Part of the other thing is just awareness. You know, I spend a lot of time and other people just getting awareness uh, around all those sustainable development goals and how could you make a difference? Yep. Because um, basically the gist of that is from the UN is they're trying to achieve all these by 2030. We'll see if that happens or not, right? Right. You know, no right. telling. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's the gist of it. And so, it. so it's just trying to give something to people to try to make a difference. I love, man, Rob, I, I love that. Um admire uh how you're using all of this this uh this te technology expertise experiences this entrepreneurial side the uh see a problem no matter how big it is solve a problem and then kind of using an open source approach to sharing i mean really uh, i admire all of that H how can folks learn more uh, about the moab foundation where, where can they go yeah you can go to moabfoundation.org uh, website. Uh, we have a deal on LinkedIn, you know, uh, I'm spamming you on Twitter about sustainable <laughs> development goals all the time as well. I um, love it. Yeah. But yeah, you know what, it, you know, back to what you're saying, you know, back to that service you do in the military, it, it's gotta be a life of service. I remember, I think one of the most, it was a billboard when George Bush senior was president and it was in Houston because that's where he lived. I remember it's a picture of him on a billboard and the, the words on it says, any definition of a successful life must include service to others. Mm. Mm. And it's like, I think he nailed it there. Agreed. Um, and so just give, 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 give. Yep. Uh, during COVID, we've been doing this Elevate Our Kids nonprofit. Yeah. So let me tee this up for a minute. Yeah. Uh, when I first met you on social, um, one of the first things I noticed that you were involved in out of all these projects and, and let's make sure we mention the podcast and, and the business and, and all the stuff you're up to this elevate for kids uh, and helping to um, uh, tackle and bridge the digital divide really got my attention. Uh, it's su it was such a cool effort. So tell us more about this. And also if you would talk, talk to our listeners about the, the massive problem we have, which, which is really uh, been made more aware because of all the, you know, the remote learning that we've gone through uh, collectively the last couple of years. So tell us more about yeah. what you're doing there. Yeah. So some of these crazy characters, I, we do our weekly IOT coffee talk. Yep. And so uh, Stephanie Atkinson, she's an analyst and Leonard Lee and some other people, it's basically a combination of analysts. And then a few, three of us are like actual inventors of some of the IOT technology. And so we do that stuff. But uh, it was really driven initially by Stephanie. You know, she lives down in Bandera, Texas, out on a ranch. And the conversation was, as you said, COVID happened. All these schools went virtual. And we started hearing stories about, well, not all those kids have laptops to go virtual. 
right. some wealthier, you know, that's when you see kind of inequities. Yeah. Um, some school districts already had kind of that, what do they call them? One-to-one programs where every kid had a laptop or some wealthy schools were giving kids iPads and stuff like that. And so we just started pondering that issue and seeing that a whole lot of kids are not going to get educated because they don't have a laptop. And so that's kind of where it began. And so um, Stephanie did the real hard work of, you know, getting, putting together this nonprofit, working with groups uh, to get us uh, mechanisms so that we can raise funds and stuff yeah. like that, that kind of thing. Um, but the goal was simple. We need to get laptops and give them to kids. And so it probably wasn't going to be MacBooks because they were too expensive. But and we, so we're looking at low cost Windows PCs and also a lot of school districts use Chromebooks. Those mm. are really popular as well. Right. So we spent a lot of time with distributors and stuff like that in the U.S. and around the world to source these laptops. We're fundraising hook or by crook or whatever. <laughs> um, and you know what? Here's another cool thing. A lot of giant corporations have money to spend on philanthropy. And if you can tap into the right folks, uh, they'd be happy to help you. And so one of the big ones we did was great was uh, if anybody's familiar with Phillips 66, yep. um, they're in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So we did a whole thing with the Tulsa school district. And so Phillips donated a bunch of money, a lot of money to us. And then we got all the laptops and we provided tons of laptops to Tulsa school district for all these kids. Awesome. We got, and we got pictures of all the kids now with their laptops. And uh, yeah, it's great because that digital divide thing has always been this ambiguous thing or people talk about it, but they're like, I don't even know what that means or right. it, doesn't, it doesn't affect me. But we're like, we're going to have a generation of kids or swaths of kids who are not going to know they're not going to get educated in high school or whatever, yep. and they are going to fall behind and we need to keep everybody going. Uh, yep. The other part too was um, connectivity. So the laptop was a huge thing, but then what did we discover? And also my wife is a school teacher. She teaches fifth grade. And so oh. I've, been I've been living this. Wow. You know, we did her teaching virtually last year and then back in person. And that's been fits and starts and sure. stuff with yep. things, you know, and, um, we would find out that, well, there are certain families that didn't have internet at their homes and stuff mm. like that. It's like, what are we going to do about that? So we started tackling that. We worked a bunch with T-Mobile. They've got a program of like, I don't know, 10 million something or other. I'm, I'm, I don't know what it's called. But anyway, T-Mobile had a plan where they had folks work to try to get connectivity to these people. And so we worked hand in hand and got laptops and, you know, like those little uh, kind of hockey puck things. Yes. Where it's, Wi-Fi like hotspot. Hotspot. That's yeah. what it is. Yep. And so we get them LTE hotspots. Love it. Uh, and get them to these families and and for free. And so these kids could go to school. And that, so that's been great. That's been the this in the horrible this time that we've been living in the pandemic. That's been the bright spot for me. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, and and uh, the size of these projects and and the support you've gotten and being able to. I love the simplicity, even if it's a big problem, it's like hammer meat nail, right? And yeah. these folks now can connect, they can learn, they're not left behind and bringing it full circle back to the beginning of our conversation with you here today, Rob, is there some of these kids who they're not, you know, their folks aren't going to be in position to bring home the computer of that time or of this time rather. And so they don't have that opportunity, not only to connect in the moment and learn in the moment, but opening up these doors that will lead and have a big impact on their journey and their livelihood and, 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 and uh, how they uh, fulfill their aspirations moving forward. Right. And, and I gotta not to be too dramatic, but man, I bet some of y'all's work in, a, in giving these families, and these kids, these electronic devices and these networks allowed them to uh, tackle that blind spot that every kid has and open up doors of you know, the art of the possible. So I, I admire, I love, you got a really cool entrepreneurial and then, and then I didn't really understand that as much in our, in, in, in uh, our social um, connectivity earlier. I love that entrepreneurial aspect. Um, and then of course, big industry, but then throughout it all is a service and to give back and to give forward as we call it here. 
And Rob, that is um, certainly a life well lived for one Rob Tiffany. <laughs> and you're not it. done. I'm We're not, not done. done. <laughs> we got lots to do. And you guys right. are doing some great stuff. I want to learn more about what you guys are doing with veterans. That's great stuff that you're doing. Well, Get veterans to, is it veterans to industry? Vets to industry. That's, that's our nonprofit industry. partners okay. over there. Brian Arrington founded that. In fact, uh, Rob, you were talking about how Moab Foundations, but kind of been on the side, you know, along with all of your careers and stuff. Well, Brian, as of today, uh, when we're recording this, he, he works full time. He's an Air Force retiree, um, works full time at Wells, founded this nonprofit. So he's he's making it happen for, you know, a big bank. And then he's building this this powerful nonprofit, which is a clearinghouse. Um, I don't know about you, when, but when I transitioned out, finding resources, all those resources out there that are really there for veterans and, mil and military spouses and families, th those in need, but it's tough to find it and then find the vetted ones, right? So mm, yeah, we all know what is what else has come up in the last twenty years uh, with with uh, some of the the folks that aren't doing good things but are right. using that flag. So vets to industry org, y'all check that out. Vets numeral two industry org. I promise you, um, there's lots and lots of good stuff there. But Rob, man. Yeah, an, an hour does not do it justice with your journey, man. It really doesn't. Um, how can folks connect with the one and only Rob Tiffany? Yeah. Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter at Rob Tiffany. Um, uh, yeah, you can go to MoabFoundation.org. Um, I'm pretty much everywhere. <laughs> It feels like it all at once because we don't and, sleep. We don't sleep, you know. <laughs> we don't. I tell you. And uh, IoT. Uh, what's the IoT podcast? Coffee Talk? That's every uh, week. Every week we do. It's on YouTube. Um, I also I do a Rob Tiffany Digital Podcast where I'm just talking about you know I haven't done like what you're doing. I'm not doing the interviewing thing. It's me just talking about certain topics to teach people about just and they're a little short, like five or ten master class, things. master class from Rob. There you go. That's Seriously. the word from last year, masterclass. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bad about using them all. Uh, I really am. Well, you got so, I mean, clearly, if you go back to that vending machine example, y'all were doing these things well, well before, way before um, uh, yeah. you know, all of it now. So, so no wonder uh, when folks need IoT expertise, uh, innovation and ideas that come to the guru, and that's just, just part of what you have to offer. You know um, what? It's what? The, the word perspective comes to mind. Mm. When I think about back then, how hard it was, it was rocket science and we had to invent the hardest things. And so when you move forward to today and people talk about, oh my gosh, this is so impossible. I'm going to build this global IoT thing or whatever. And you're like, no, we got this. This is trivial compared to what we did back then where we had to invent every last thing. That's right. And so it does give you perspective, just like the perspective you get serving in the military under a level of stress that people in the business world have no comprehension of. Excellent point. And so it, point. it helps you in business and in life where you're just like, well, you know, I used to be at launch depth with my submarine. And I think that was a little more stressful than this little thing. <laughs> right. Perspective. That is a great... And, you know, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, one of the brilliant people I worked with in uh, uh, manufacturing, he uh, was an engineer that designed uh, dies, right, for metal stamping. Just okay. genius. And I, I came in one time to his office and I was, I had some, I don't know, some small little problem as he's orchestrating this, 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 this big new program. And he's like, Scott that's small potatoes. I ain't got time for small potatoes. And that one moment has stuck with me kind of to your point, you know, taking a step back and just kind of really gaining a little perspective, a little context. Uh, a lot of times our biggest problems we think are really not that big. Right. Um, all right. So Rob Tiffany, we're going to have you back. Thank you so much for your time here today. Um, really appreciate all that you've shared. I mean, we, we really, we touched on it all uh, from video games, to submarines, uh, military experiences to technology evolution. Um, and my favorite part, that purposeful uh, give back, give forward. So thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks so much for having me. This has been great. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, so don't go anywhere just yet. Uh, listeners, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this really unique and very special episode of Veteran Voices. I had no idea 
um, the, the some of the products and technologies and innovation um, that I'd kind of forgotten about, including some of the cool things that Rob was on the on the cutting edge of. So make sure you connect with Rob. Check out his podcasts. Uh, he's a great Twitter follow, by the way, as well. Uh, but connect with him on LinkedIn as well. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you like stuff like this, uh, find Veteran Voices and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Be sure to check out uh, our great uh, friends over at vets2industry.org. They could use your support as well. Beyond it all, whatever you do. If, if, Rob, if Rob and his story and his perspective don't get your blood going, getting ready to run through a, a wall, you got to check your pulse, right? Check your pulse. But hey, Scott Luton Challenge, you can do good. Give forward, be the change that's needed. On that note, we'll see you next time right back here on Veteran Voices. Thanks, everybody.